The third trip, or Beanar. The purple sage cursed and waxed sorely pissed and cried out in a loud voice, A pox upon the accursed Illuminati of Bavaria. May their seed take no root. May their hands tremble, their eyes dim, and their spines curl up, yea, verily, like unto the backs of snails. And may the vaginal orifices of their women be clogged with brillo pads. For they have sinned against God and nature. They have made of life a prison. And they have stolen the green from the grass and the blue from the sky. And so saying and grimacing and groaning, the purple sage left the world of men and women and retired to the desert in despair and heavy grumpiness. But the high chaparral laughed and said to the Erisian faithful, Our brother torments himself with no cause, for even the malign Illuminati are unconscious pawns of the divine plane of Our Lady. Mordecai, Malignatus, Cayenne, The Book of Contradictions, Liba 555. October the 23rd, 1970, was the 35th anniversary of the murder of Arthur Flagenheimer, alias the Dutchman, alias Dutch Schultz. But this dreary lot has no intention of commemorating that occasion. They are the Knights of Christianity United in Faith. The group in Atlantis were called Mouths of Le Havre Keraft. United for the truth, you see what I mean. And their president, James J. Smiling Jim Treponema, has noted a bearded and therefore suspicious young man among the delegates. Such types were not likely to be KCUF members and might even be dope fiends. Smiling Jim told the Andy Frayne ushers to keep a watchful eye on the young man so no funny business could occur and then went to the podium to begin his talk on sex education, communist Trojan horse in our schools. In Atlantis, it was numbers, nothing Aryan squid trap in our schools. The same drivel eternally. The bearded young man, who happened to be Simon Moon, advisor to Teen Set magazine on Illuminati affairs and instructor in sexual yoga to numerous black young ladies, observed that he was being observed, which made him think of Heisenberg, and settled back in his chair to doodle pentagons on his notepad. Three rows ahead, a crew-cut middle-aged man who looked like a suburban Connecticut doctor also settled back comfortably, awaiting his opportunity. The funny business that he and Simon had in mind would be, he hoped, very funny indeed. We shall not, we shall not be moved. There is a road going due east from Dayton, Ohio, toward New Lebanon and Brookville. And on a small farm off that road lives an excellent man named James V. Riley, who is a sergeant on the Dayton Police Force. Although he grieves the death of his wife two years back in 67 and worries about his son... It seems to be in some shady business involving frequent travel between New York City and Cuernavaca. The sergeant is basically a cheerful man. But on June the 25th, 1969, he was a bit out of sorts and generally not up to snuff because of his arthritis and the seemingly endless series of pointless and peculiar questions being asked by the reporter from New York. It didn't make sense... Who would want to publish a book about John Dillinger at this late date? And why would such a book deal with Dillinger's dental history? You're the same James Riley who was on the Mooresville, Indiana force when Dillinger was first arrested in 1924? The reporter had begun. Yeah, Santa smart alecky young punk he was. I don't hold with some of these people who've written books about him and said the long sentence he got back then is what made him bitter and turned him bad. He got the long sentence because he was so snotty to the judge. 
Not a sign of repentance or remorse, just wisecracks and a know-it-all grin spread all over his face. A bad apple from the start, and always hell-bent for leather, in a hurry to get God knows where. Sometimes folks used to joke that there were two of him he'd go through town so fast, rushing to his own funeral. Young punks like that never get long enough sentences, if you want my opinion. Might slow him down a bit. Very porter. What was his name again? James Mallison, hadn't he said? Was impatient. Yes, yes, I'm sure we need stricter laws and harsher penalties, but what I want to know was, where was Dillinger's missing tooth? On the right side or the left side of his face? Saints in heaven, you expect me to remember that after all these years? The reporter dabbed his forehead with a handkerchief. Very nervous, he seemed to be. Look, Sergeant... Some psychologists say we never forget anything, really. It's all stored somewhere inside our brain. Now, just try to picture John Dillinger as you remember him with that know-it-all grin, as you called it. Can you get the picture in a focus? Which side is the missing tooth on? Listen, I'm due to go on duty in a few minutes, and I can't be... Madison's face changed, as if in desperation, which he was trying to conceal. Well, let me ask you a different question. Are you a mason? A mason? But Jesus, no. I've been a Catholic all my life, I'll have you know. Well, did you know any masons in Mooresville, I mean, to talk to? Why would I be talking to the likes of them with the terrible things they're always saying about the church? The reporter plunged on. All the books on Dillinger say that the intended victim of that first robbery, the grocer B.F. Morgan, summoned help by giving the Masonic signal of distress. Do you know what that is? It would have to be a mason. I, I'm sure they wouldn't be telling. The way they keep their secrets by the saints, I'm sure even the FBI couldn't find out. The reporter finally left, but Sergeant Riley, a methodical man, filed his name in memory. James Mallison. What did he say? Joseph Mallison. A strange book he claimed to be writing about Dillinger's teeth and the bloody atheistic Freemasons. There was more to this than met the eye, obviously. Like a tree that's planted by the water, we shall not be moved. Miskatonic University in Arkham, Massachusetts, is not a well-known campus by any means. And the few scholarly visitors who come there are an odd lot, drawn usually by the strange collection of occult books given to the Miskatonic Library by the late Dr. Henry Armitage. Miss Doris Horace, the librarian, had never seen quite such a strange visitor, though, as this professor, J.D. Mallison, who claimed to come from Dayton, Ohio, but spoke with an unmistakable New York accent. Considering his furtiveness, she found it no surprise that he spent the whole day June the 26th, 1969, poring over the rare copy of Dr. John Dee's translation of the Necronomicon of Abdul Alhatsred. That was the book most of the queer ones went for. That or the Book of Sacred Magic of Abra Melin the Mage. Doris didn't like the Necronomicon although she considered herself an emancipated and free-thinking young woman. There was something sinister, or to be downright honest about it, perverted about that book, and not in a nice, exciting way, but in a sick and frightening way. All those strange illustrations, always with five-sided borders, just like the Pentagon in Washington, but with these people inside doing all these freaky sex acts with these other creatures who weren't people at all. It was, frankly, Doris's opinion that old Abdul al Hatsred had been smoking some pretty bad grass when he dreamed up those things. Or maybe it was something stronger than grass, she remembered one sentence from the text. Only those who have eaten a certain alkaloid herb whose name it were wise not to disclose to the unilluminated, may in the fleshy see a shoggoth. 
I wonder what a shoggoth is, Doris thought idly. Probably one of those disgusting creatures that the people in the illustrations are doing those horny things with. Ugh! She was glad when J.D. Mallison finally left and she could return the Necronomicon to its position on the closed shelves. She remembered the brief biography of crazy old Abdul al read that Dr. Armitage had written and also given to the library. Spent seven years in the desert and claimed to have visited Irem, the city forbidden in the Koran, which al read asserted was of pre-human origin. Silly. Who was around to build cities before there were people? Those shogoths? An indifferent Muslim, he worshipped beings whom he called yog sothoth and Cthulhu. And that insidious line, according to contemporary historians, al Hatswed's death was both tragic and bizarre, since it was asserted that he was eaten alive by an invisible monster in the middle of the marketplace. Dr. Armitage had been such a nice old man, Doris remembered. Even if his talk about Kabbalistic numbers and Masonic symbols was a little peculiar at times. Why would he collect such icky books by creepy people? The Internal Revenue Service knows this much about Robert Putney Drake. During the last fiscal year, he earned... Twenty-three million and five dollars on stocks and bonds in various defence corporations. Seventeen million five hundred and twenty-three from the three banks he controlled, and five million eight hundred and seven thousand four hundred dollars from various real estate holdings. They did not know that he also banked in Switzerland over 100 million from prostitution, an equal amount from heroin and gambling, and 2,500,000 from pornography. On the other hand, they didn't know either about certain legitimate business expenses, which he had not cared to claim, including more than 5 million in bribes to various legislators, judges and police officials in all 50 states, in order to maintain the laws which made men's vices so profitable to him, and $50,000 to Knights of Christianity United in Faith, as a last-ditch effort to stave off total legalization of pornography and the collapse of that part of his empire. What the deuce do you make of this? Barney Muldoon asked. He was holding an amulet in his hand. Found it in the bedroom, he explained, holding it for Saul to examine the strange design. Part of it is Chinese, Saul said thoughtfully. The basic design, two interlocking commas, one pointing up and the other down. It means that opposites are equal. What does that mean? Muldoon asked sarcastically. Opposites are opposite, not equal. You'd have to be a Chinaman to think otherwise. Saul ignored the comment. But the Pentagon isn't in the Chinese design, and neither is the apple with the K in it. Suddenly he grinned. Wait. I bet I know what it is. It's from Greek mythology. There was a banquet on Olympus, and Eris wasn't invited, because she was the goddess of discord and always made trouble. So, to get even, she made more trouble. She created a beautiful golden apple and wrote on it, Callisti. That means... For the prettiest one, in Greek. It's what the K stands for, obviously. Then she rolled it into the banquet hall, and naturally all the goddesses there immediately claimed that each one saying that she was the prettiest one. Finally, old man Zeus himself, to settle the squabble, allowed Paris to decide which goddess was the prettiest and who should get the apple. He chose Aphrodite, and as a reward... She gave him an opportunity to kidnap Helen, which led to the Trojan War. Very interesting, Muldoon said. And does that tell us what Joseph Malik knew about the assassinations of the Kennedy and this Illuminati bunch and why his office was blown up or where he's disappeared to? Well, no, Sewell said. 
But it's nice to find something in this case that I can recognize. I just wish I knew what the Pentagon means, too. Let's look at the rest of the memos, Muldoon suggested. The next memo, however, stopped them cold. Illuminati Project Memo 9, 7-28, J.M. The chart appeared in the East Village Other, June 11, 1969, with the label Current Structure of the Bavarian Illuminati Conspiracy and the Law of Fives. The chart hangs at the top of the page, the rest of which is empty space, as if the editors originally intended to publish an article explaining it, but decided, or were persuaded, to suppress all but the diagram itself. Pat. This one has to be some damned hippie or yippie hoax, Muldoon said after a long pause, but he sounded uncertain. Part of it is, Saul said thoughtfully, keeping certain thoughts to himself. Typical hippie psychology, mixing truth and fantasy to blow the fuses of the establishment. The Elders of Zion section is just a parody of Nazi ideology. If there really was a Jewish conspiracy to run the world, my rabbi would have let me in on it by now. I contribute enough to the shul. My brother's a Jesuit, Maldon added, pointing at the Society of Jesus Square. And he never invited me into any worldwide conspiracy. But this part is almost plausible, so said, pointing to the sphere of aftermath. Aga Khan is the head of the Ishmaelian sect of Islam, and that sect was founded by Hassani Saba, the old man of the mountains, who led the Hashishim into the 11th century. Adam Weishaupt is supposed to have originated the Bavarian Illuminati after studying Saba, according to the third memo. So this part fits together. And Hassani Saba is supposed to be the first one to introduce marijuana and hashish to the Western world from India. That ties in with Weishaupt's growing hemp and Washington's having a big hemp crop at Mount Vernon. Wait a minute. Look at how the whole design revolves around the Pentagon. Everything else sort of grows out of it. So, you think the Defense Department is the international hub of the Illuminati conspiracy? Let's just read the rest of the memos. Muldoon suggested. The Indian agent at the Menominee Reservation in Wisconsin knows this. From the time Billy Frechette returned there until her death in 1968... She received mysterious monthly checks from Switzerland. He thinks he knows the explanation. Despite all stories to the contrary, Billy did help to betray Dillinger, and this is the payoff. He is convinced of this. He is also quite wrong. Children, seven and eight years old. Smiling Jim Trepamina is telling the KCUF audience. Are talking about... Penises and vaginas, and using those very words. Now, is this an accident? Let me quote you Lennon's own words. Simon yawns. Banana Nose Maldonado evidently had his own brand of sentimentality or superstition, and in 1936 he ordered his son, a priest, to say 100 masses for the salvation of the Dutchman's soul. Even years afterward, he would defend the Dutchman in conversation. It was okay, Dutch was. If you didn't cross him, if you did forget it, you were finished. He was almost a Siciliano about that. Otherwise, he was a good businessman and the first one with a real CPA mind in the whole organization. If he hadn't gotten that crazy head idea about gunning down Tom Dewey, he'd still be a big man. I told him myself, you killed Dewey, I said, and the shit hits the fan everywhere. The boys won't take the risk. Lucky and the butcher want to cowboy you right now. But he wouldn't listen. Nobody fucks with me, he said. I don't care if his name is Dewey, Louie, or Fooey. He dies. A real German Jew. You couldn't talk to him. I even told him Al Capone helped set up Dillinger for the feds just because of the heat those bank heists were bringing down. And you know what he said? He said, you tell Al that Dillinger was a lone wolf. I have my own pack. Too bad. 
too bad, too bad. I'll light another candle for him at church on Sunday. Hand in hand together, we shall not be moved. Rebecca Goodman closes her book wearily and stares into space, thinking about Babylon. Her eyes focus suddenly on the statue Saul had bought her for her last birthday. The mermaid of Copenhagen. How many Danes, she wonders, know that this is one form of representation of the Babylonian sex goddess Ishtar. In Central Park, Perry the Squirrel is beginning to hunt for the day's food. A French poodle, held on a leash by a mink-coated lady, barks at him, and he runs three times round a tree. George Dawn looks at the face of a corpse. It is his own face. In Wyoming, after one sex education class in high school, the teacher was raped by 17 boys, she said later. She would never teach sex in school again. Making sure he is alone in the meditation room of the UN building, the man calling himself Frank Sullivan quickly moves the black plinth aside and descends the hidden stairs into the tunnel. He is thinking whimsically that hardly anybody realises that the shape of the room is the same as the truncated pyramid on the dollar bill, or guesses what that means. In Wilmette, Illinois, an eight-year-old boy came home from a sensitivity training class and tried to have intercourse with his four-year-old sister. Simon gave up on his pentagons and began doodling pyramids instead. Above, beyond Joe Malik's window, Saul Goodman gave up on the line of thought which had led him to surmise that the Illuminati were a front for the International Psychoanalytical Society, conspiring to drive everyone paranoid and turned back to the desk and the memos. Barney Muldoon came in from the bedroom, carrying a strange amulet, and asked, What do you make of this? Saul looked at a design of an apple and a pentagon. And several years earlier, Simon Moon looked at the same medallion. They call it the secret cow, Padre Pederastia said. They sat alone at a table pulled off to the corner. Friendly Stranger was the same as ever, except that a new group, the American Medical Association, consisting naturally of four kids from Germany, had replaced H.P. Lovecraft in the back room. Nobody knew that the AMA was going to become the world's most popular rock group within a year, but Simon already thought they were super heavy. Padre Pederastia was, as on the night Simon met Miss Mao, very serious and hardly camping at all. Sacred cow? Simon asked. It's pronounced that way, but you spell it C-H-A-O. A cow is a single unit of chaos, they figure. The Padre smiled. Too much. They're nuttier than the SSS, Simon objected. Never underestimate absurdity. It is one door to the imagination. Do I have to remind you of that? We have an alliance with them? Simon asked. The jams can't do it alone. Yes, we have an alliance, as long as it profits both parties. John, Mr. Sullivan himself, authorized this. Okay, what do they call themselves? The LDD. The Padre permitted himself a smile. New members are told the initials stand for Legion of Dynamic Discord. Later on, quite often, the leader a most fetching scoundrel and madman named Chalene, sometimes tells them it really stands for little deluded dupes. That's the Pan's Asinorum, or an early Pan's Asinorum in Chalene's system. He judges them by how they react to that. Chalene's system? Simon asked warily. It leads to the same destination as ours, more or less, by a somewhat wilder and Woolly a path. Right hand or left hand path? Right hand, the priest said. All absurdist systems are right hand. Well, almost all. They don't invoke you-know-who under any circumstances. They rely on Discordia. Do you remember your Roman myths? Enough to know that Discordia is just the Latin equivalent of Eris. They're part of the Arisian Liberation Front, then. 
Simon was beginning to wish he was stoned. These conspiratorial conversations always made more sense when he was slightly high. He wondered how people like the President of the United States or the Chairman of the Board of GM were able to plot such intricate games without being on a trip at the time. Or did they take enough tranquilizers to produce a similar effect? No, the priest said flatly. Don't ever make that mistake. ELF is much more, um, esoteric outfit than the LDD. Chalene is on the activist side, like us. Some of his capers make Maritori or God's Lightning look like Trappists by comparison. No, ELF will never get on Mr. Chalene's trip. He's got an absurdist yoga and an activist ethic, Simon reflected. The two don't mix. Chalene is a walking contradiction. Look at his symbol again. I've been looking at it, and that Pentagon worries me. Are you sure he's on our side? The American Medical Association came to some kind of erotic or musical climax, and the priest's answer was drowned out. What? Simon asked after the applause died down. I said, Padre Pederastia whispered, that we're never sure anybody is on our side. Uncertainty is the name of the game. Illuminati Project Memo 10, 7 stroke 28, JM. On the origin of the pyramid and eye symbol, test your credulity on the following yarn from Flying Saucers in the Bible by Virginia Brassington. Sorcerian Books, 1963, page 43. The Continental Congress had asked Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson and John Adams to arrange for a seal for the United States of America. None of the designs they created or which were submitted to them were suitable. Fairly late at night, after working on the project all day, Jefferson walked out into the cool night air of the garden to clear his mind. In a few minutes, he rushed back into the room, crying jubilantly, I have it! I have it! Indeed, he did have some plans in his hands. They were the plans showing the Great Seal as we know it today. Asked how he got the plans, Jefferson told a strange story. A man approached him wearing a black cloak that practically covered him, face and all, and he told him that he, the stranger, knew they were trying to devise a seal, and that he had a design which was appropriate and meaningful. After the excitement died down, the three went into the garden to find the stranger, but he was gone. Thus, neither these founding fathers, nor anybody else, ever knew who really designed the great seal of the United States. Pat. Illuminati Project Memo 11, 7 stroke 29. J.M. The latest I've found on the Iron Pyramid is in a San Francisco underground paper. Planet, San Francisco, July 1969, Volume 1, Number 4 suggesting it as a symbol for Timothy Leary's political party when he was running for governor of California instead of just running. The emblem is a tentative design for the party's campaign button. One wag suggests that everyone cut out the circle from the back of a dollar bill and send the holy dollar to Governor Leary so he could wallpaper his office with them. Then paste the emblem on your front door to signify your membership in the party. Translations. The year of the beginning new secular order. Both translations are wrong, of course. Anuit coeptis means he blesses our beginning. And Novus Ordo Seclorum means a new order of the ages. Ah, oh, well. Scholarship was never the hippie's strong point. But Tim Leary, an Illuminatus? And pasting the eye on the door. I can't help but think of the Hebrews marking their doorways with the blood of a lamb so that the angel of death would pass by their houses. Pat. Illuminati Project Memo 12. Eight stroke three. J.M. I've finally found the basic book on the Illuminati. 
Proofs of a Conspiracy by John Robison. Christian Book Club of America, Hawthorne, California, 1961. Originally published in 1801. Robison was an English mason who discovered through personal experience that the French Masonic lodges, such as the Grand Orient, were Illuminati fronts and were the main instigators of the French Revolution. His whole book is very explicit about how Weishaupt worked. Every infiltrated Masonic group would have several levels, like an ordinary Masonic lodge, but as candidates advance through the various degrees, they would be told more about the real purposes of the movement. Those at the bottom simply thought they were Masons. In the middle levels, they knew they were engaged in a great project to change the world, but the exact nature of the change was explained to them according to what the leaders thought they were prepared to know. Only those at the top knew the secret, which according to Robeson, is this. The Illuminati aims to overthrow all government and religion, setting up an anarcho-communist free-love world. And because the end justifies the means, a principal Weishaupt acquired from his Jesuit youth, they didn't care how many people they killed to accomplish that noble purpose. Robeson knows nothing of earlier Illuminati movements, but does say specifically that the Bavarian Illuminati was not destroyed by the government's crackdown in 1785, but was, in fact, still active, both in England and France, and possibly elsewhere, when he wrote in 1801. On page 116, Robeson lists their existing lodges as follows. Germany, 84 lodges. England, eight lodges. Scotland, two. Warsaw, two. Switzerland, many. Rome, Naples, Ancona, Florence, France, Holland, Dresden, four. United States of America, several. On page 101, he mentions that there are 13 ranks in the order. This may account for the 13 steps on their symbolic pyramid. Page 84 gives the code name of Weishaupt, which was Spartacus. His second in command, Freiherr Knigger, had the code name Philo, page 117. This is revealed in papers seized by the Bavarian government in a raid on the home of a lawyer named Zvak, who had the code name Cato. Babeuf, the French revolutionary, evidently took the name Gracchus in imitation of the classical style of these titles. Robeson's conclusion, page 269, is worth quoting. Nothing is as dangerous as a mystic association. The object remaining a secret in the hands of the managers, the rest simply put a ring in their own noses by which they may be led about at pleasure. And still panting after the secret, they are the more pleased the less they see. Pat. At the bottom of the page was a note in pencil, scrawled with a decisive masculine hand. It said, In the beginning was the word, and it was written by a baboon. Illuminati Project, Memo 13, 8 stroke 5. J.M. The survival of the Bavarian Illuminati throughout the 19th century and into the 20th is the subject of World Revolution by Nesta Webster, Constable of Company, London, 1921. Mrs. Webster follows Robeson fairly closely on the early days of the movement up to the French Revolution, but then veers off and says that the Illuminati never intended to create their utopian anarcho-communist society, that was just another of their masks. Their real purpose was dictatorship over the world. And so they soon formed a secret alliance with the Prussian government. All subsequent socialist, anarchist and communist movements are mere decoys, she argues, behind which the German general staff and the Illuminati are plotting to overthrow other governments, 
so Germany can conquer them. She wrote right after England fought Germany in the First World War. I see no way of reconciling this with the Birchers' thesis that the Illuminati has become a front for the Rhodes Scholars to take over the world for English domination. Obviously, as Robeson states, the Illuminati say different things to different people to get them into the conspiracy. As for the links with modern communism, here are some passages from her pages 234 to 45. But now that the first Internationale was dead, it became necessary for the secret societies to reorganise. And it is at this crisis that we find that formidable sect springing to life again, the original Illuminati of Weishaupt. What we do know definitely is that the society was refounded in Dresden in 1880, that it was consciously modelled on its 18th century predecessor is clear from the fact that its chief, one Leopold Engel, was the author of a lengthy panegyric on Weishaupt and his order, entitled Geschichte des Illuminaten Ordens, published in 1906. In London, a lodge called by the same name, carried on the right of Memphis, founded, it is said, by Cagliostro on Egyptian models, and initiated adepts into illuminized Freemasonry. Was it a mere coincidence that in July 1889 an International Socialist Congress decided that May the 1st, which was the day on which Weishaupt founded the Illuminati, should be chosen for an annual international labour demonstration. Pat. Illuminati Project Memo 14. 8 stroke 6. JM. And here's still another version of the origin of the Illuminati from the Kabbalist Eliphas Levi. The History of Magic by Eliphas Levi, Borden Publishing Company, Los Angeles, 1963, page 65. He says there were two Zoroasters, a true one who taught white right-hand magic and a false one who taught black left-hand magic, he goes on. To the false Zoroaster must be referred to the cultus of material fire and that impious doctrine of divine dualism which produced at a later period the monstrous gnosis of manes and the false principles of spurious masonry. The Zoroaster in question was the father of that materialised magic which led to the massacre of the Magi and brought their true doctrine at first into proscription and then oblivion. Inspired by the spirit of truth, the church was forced to condemn, under the names of magic, Manichaeanism, Illuminism and Masonry, all that was in kinship, remote or approximate, with the primitive profanation of the mysteries. One signal example is the history of the Knights Templar, which has been misunderstood to this day. Levi does not elucidate that last sentence. It is interesting, however, that Nestor Webster, see Memo 13, also traced the Illuminati to the Knights Templar, whereas Darao and most other sources track them eastward to the Hashishim. Is all this making me paranoid? I'm beginning to get the impression that the evidence has not only been hidden in obscure books, but also made confusing and contradictory to discourage the researcher. Pat. Scrawled on the bottom of this memo was a series of jottings in the same masculine hand. Malik's sole guest, that had jotted the baboon reference on memo 12. The jotting said, Check on order of de mole. Elevenfold de mole cross... Eleven intersections, therefore twenty-two lines. The twenty-two Atos of Tahuti. Why not twenty-three? T-A-R-O equals T-O-R-A equals T-R-O-A equals A-T-O-R equals R-O-T-A exclamation mark. 
Query, 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 query. Abdul Al Hatred equals A. A. Query, query, exclamation mark. Oh, Christ. Barney groaned. Oh, Mary and Joseph. Oh, shit. We'll end up either becoming mystics or going crazy before this case is over, if there's any difference. The Order of the Mole is a Masonic society for boys. So commented helpfully. I don't know what the Aetis of Tahuri are, but that sounds Egyptian. Taro, usually spelled T-A-R-O-T, is the deck of cards gypsy fortune tellers use, and the word gypsy means Egyptian. Torah is the law in Hebrew. We keep coming back to something that has roots in both Jewish mysticism and Egyptian magic. The Knights Templar were kicked out of the church, Barney said, for trying to combine Christian and Muslim ideas. Last year, my brother, the Jesuit, gave a lecture on how modern ideas are just old heresies from the Middle Ages warmed over. I had to go for politeness's sake. I remember something else he said about the Templars. They were engaged in what he called unnatural sex acts. In other words, they were faggots. You get the impression that all these groups related to the Illuminati are all male? Maybe the big secret they're hiding so fanatically is that they're all some vast worldwide homosexual plot. I've heard showbiz people complain about what they call the Haman Turn, a homo organization that tries to keep all the best jobs for other fruits. How does that sound? Sounds plausible, so said ironically. But it also sounds plausible to say the Illuminati is a Jewish conspiracy, a Catholic conspiracy, a Masonic conspiracy, a communist conspiracy, a banker's conspiracy, and I suppose we'll eventually find evidence to suggest it's an interplanetary scheme masterminded from Mars or Venus. Don't you see, Barney? Whatever they're really up to, they keep creating masks, so all sorts of scapegoat groups will get the blame for being the real Illuminati. He shook his head dismally. They're smart enough to know they can operate indefinitely without a few people eventually realizing something's there. So they've taken that into account and arranged for an inquisitive outsider to get all sorts of wrong ideas about who they are. They're dogs, Muldoon said. Intelligent talking dogs from the dog star Sirius. They came here and ate Malik. Just like they ate that guy in Kansas City, except that time they didn't get to finish the job. He turned back and read from Memo 8. With his throat torn, as if by the talons of some enormous beast. No animal was reported missing from any of the local zoos. He grinned. Lord God, I'm almost ready to believe it. They were werewolves, Saul answered, grinning also. The Pentagon is the symbol of the werewolf. Look at the Late Late Show sometime. That's the pentagram, not the pentagon. Barney lit a cigarette, adding, This is really getting on our nerves, isn't it? Saul looked up wearily and glanced around the apartment, almost as if he were looking for its absent owner. Joseph Malik, he said aloud, What can of worms have you opened, and how far back does it go? We shall not, we shall not be moved. In fact, for Joseph Malik, the beginning was several years earlier. In a medley of tear gas, hymn singing, billy clubs and obscenity, all of which were provoked by the imminent nomination for president of a man named Hubert Horatio Humphrey. It began in Lincoln Park on the night of August the 25th, 1968 while Joe was waiting to be tear-gassed. He did not know then that anything was beginning. He was only conscious, in an acid, gut-sour way, of what was ending, his own faith in the Democratic Party. He was sitting with the concerned clergymen under the cross they had erected. He was thinking bitterly that they should have erected a tombstone instead. It should have said, Here lies the New Deal. Here lies the belief that all evil is on the other side, among the reactionaries and Ku Kluxers. Here lies twenty years of the hopes and dreams and sweat and blood of Joseph Wendell Malik. Here lies American liberalism, 
clubbed to death by Chicago's heroic peace officers. They're coming, a voice near him said suddenly. Concerned clergymen immediately began singing. We shall not be moved. We'll be moved, all right. A dry, sardonic W.C. Field's voice said quietly. When the tear gas hits, we'll be moved. Joe recognised the speaker. It was novelist William Burroughs with his usual poker face, utterly without anger or contempt or indignation or hope or faith or any emotion Joe could understand. But he sat there, making his own protest against Hubert Horatio Humphrey by placing his body in front of Chicago's police. For reasons Joe could not understand. How, Joe wondered, can a man have courage without faith, without belief? Burroughs believed in nothing, and yet there he sat, stubborn as Luther. Joe had always had faith in something. Roman Catholicism, long ago, and Trotskyism at college, then for nearly two decades, mainstream liberalism. Arthur Schlesinger, Jr.'s vital centre. And now with that dead, he was trying desperately to summon up faith in the motley crowd of dope and astrology-obsessed yippies, black Maoists, old-line hardcore pacifists, and arrogantly dogmatic SDS kids who had come to Chicago to protest a rigged convention and were being beaten and brutalised unspeakably for it. Allen Ginsberg, sitting amid a huddle of yippies off to the right, began chanting again, as he had all evening. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Ginsberg believed. He believed in everything. In democracy, in socialism, in communism, in anarchism. In Ezra Pound's idealistic variety of fascist economics. In Buckminster Fuller's technological utopia. In D.H. Lawrence's return to pre-industrial pastoralism. And in Hinduism, Buddhism, Judaism, Christianity, voodoo, astrology, magic. But above all, in the natural goodness of man. The natural goodness of man. Joe hadn't fully believed in that since Buchenwald was revealed to the world in 1944 when he was 17. Kill, kill, kill came the chant of the police. Exactly like the night before, the same... Neolithic scream of rage that signalled the beginning of the first massacre. They were coming, clubs in hand, spraying the tear gas before them. Kill, kill, kill. Auschwitz, USA, Joe thought, sickened. If they had been issued Zyklon B along with the tear gas and mace, they would be using it just as happily. Slowly, the concerned clergymen came to their feet, holding dampened handkerchiefs to their faces. Unarmed and helpless, they prepared to hold their ground as long as possible before the inevitable retreat. A moral victory, Joe thought bitterly. All we ever achieve are moral victories. The immoral brutes win the real victories. All hail Discordia, said a voice among the clergymen. A bearded young man named Simon, who had been arguing in favour of anarchism against some SDS Maoists earlier in the day. And that was the last sentence Joe Malik remembered clearly. For it was gas and clubs and screams and blood from then on. He had no way of guessing at the time that hearing that sentence was the most important thing that happened to him in Lincoln Park. Harry Coyne curls his long body into a knot of tension, resting on his elbows and sighting the Remington rifle carefully as the motorcade passes the book depository and heads toward his perch on the triple underpass. He could see Bernard Barker from the CIA down on the grassy knoll. If he carried this off right, they promised him more jobs. It would be the end of petty crime for him, the beginning of big-time money. In a way, he was sorry. Kennedy seemed like a nice enough young fellow. Harry would like to make it with both him and that hot-looking wife of his at the same time. But money talks, and sentiment is only for fools. He released the bolt action, ignoring the sudden barking of a dog, and took aim. Just as the three shots resounded from the grassy knoll. Jesus motherfucking Christ, he said. And then he caught the glint of the rifle in the book depository window. 
Great God Almighty, how the fuck many of us are there here? He cried out, scampering to his feet and starting to run. It was almost a year after being clubbed, June the 22nd, 1969, that Joe returned to Chicago to witness another rigged convention to suffer further disillusionment, to meet Simon once more and hear the mysterious phrase, All hail Discordia! Again. The convention this time was the last ever held by the students for a democratic society. And from the first hour after it opened, Joe realised that the progressive Labour faction had stacked all the cards in advance. It was the Democratic Party all over again. And it would have been equally bloody if the PL boys had their own police force to deal with the dissenters, known then as RYM1 and RYM2. Lacking that factor, the smouldering violence remained purely verbal. But when it was all over, another part of Joe Malik was dead, and his faith in the natural goodness of man was eroded still further. And so he found himself aimlessly searching for something that was not totally corrupt, attending the anarchist caucus at the old Wobbly Hall on North Halstead Street. Joe knew nothing about anarchism, except that several famous anarchists, Parsons and Spies, of Chicago's Haymarket Riot in 1888, Sacco and Vanzetti in Massachusetts, and the Wobbly's own poet laureate, Joe Hill, had been executed for murders which they apparently hadn't really committed. Beyond that, anarchists wanted to abolish government, a proposition so evidently absurd that Joe had never bothered to read any of their theoretical or polemical works. Now, however, eating the maggoty meat of his growing disillusionment with every conventional approach to politics, he began to listen to the Wobblies and other anarchists with acute curiosity. After all, the words of his favourite fictional hero, when you've eliminated all other possibilities, whatever remains, however improbable, must be true. The anarchists, Joe found, were not going to quit SDS. We'll stay in and do some righteous ass-kicking, one of them said to the applause and cheers of the others. Beyond that, however, they seemed to be in a welter of ideological disagreement. Gradually, he began to identify the conflicting positions expressed. The individualist anarchists, who sounded like right-wing republicans, except that they wanted to get rid of all functions of government, the anarcho-syndicalists and wobblies, who sounded like Marxists, except that they wanted to get rid of all functions of government. The anarcho-pacifists, who sounded like Gandhi and Martin Luther King, except that they wanted to get rid of all functions of government. And a group who were dubbed, rather affectionately, the crazies, whose position was utterly unintelligible. Simon was among the crazies. In a speech that Joe followed only with difficulty, Simon declared that cultural revolution was more important than political revolution, that Bugs Bunny should be adopted as the symbol of anarchists everywhere, that Hoffman's discovery of LSD in 1943 was a manifestation of direct intervention by God in human affairs, that the nomination of the boar hog Pegasus for President of the United States by the Yippies had been the most transcendentally lucid political act of the 20th century, and that mass orgies of pot smoking and fucking on every street corner was the most practical next step in liberating the world from tyranny. He also urged deep study of the tarot to fight the real enemy with their own weapons, whatever that meant. He was launching into a peroration about the mystic significance of the number 23, pointing out that 2 plus 3 equals 5, the pentad within which the devil can be invoked, as for example in a pentacle or at the Pentagon building in Washington, while 2 divided by 3 equals 0.666, the number of the beast, according to that freaked out revelation of St. John the Mushroom Head. The 23 itself was present esoterically because of its conspicuous exoteric absence in the number series represented by the Wobbly Hall address, which was 2422 North Halstead. 
and that the dates of the assassinations of John F. Kennedy and Lee Harvey Oswald, November 22 and 24, also had a conspicuous 23 absent in between them. When he finally was shouted down, the conversation returned to a more mundane level. Half in whimsy and half in despair, Joe decided to perform one of his chronic acts of faith and convince himself, at least for a while, that there was some kind of meaning in Simon's ramblings. His equally chronic scepticism, he knew, would soon enough reassert itself. What the world calls sanity has led us to the present planetary crises, Simon had said. And insanity is the only viable alternative. That was a paradox worth some kind of consideration. About that 23, Joe said, approaching Simon tentatively after the meeting broke up. It's everywhere, was the instant reply. I just started to scratch the surface. All the great anarchists died on the 23rd day of some month or other. Sacco and Vansetti on August 23rd, Bonnie Parker and Clyde Barrow on May 23rd, Dutch on October 23rd, and Vince Call was 23 years old when he was shot on 23rd Street, even though John Dillinger died on the 22nd of July. If you look it up like I did in Tolan's book, The Dillinger Days, you'll find he couldn't get away from the 23 principle because 23 other people died that night in Chicago, too, all from heat prostration. Nova heat moving in, Dig. And the war began on October 23rd in 4004 B.C., according to Bishop Usher. And the Hungarian Revolution started on October 23rd, too. And Harpo Marx was born on November 23rd, and... There was more of it, much more. And Joe patiently listened to all of it, determined to continue his experiment in applied schizophrenia, at least for this one evening. They retired to a nearby restaurant, the Seminary on Fullerton Street, and Simon rambled on over beers, proceeding to the mystic significance of the letter W, 23rd in the alphabet, and its presence in the words woman and womb, as well as in the shape of the feminine breasts and spread-eagled legs of the copulating female. He even found some mystic meaning in the W in Washington, but was strangely evasive about explicating this. So, you see, Simon was explaining when the restaurant was starting to close, the whole key to liberation is magic. Anarchism remains tied to politics and remains a form of death like all other politics until it breaks free from the defined reality of capitalist society and creates its own reality. A pig for president, acid in the water supply, fucking in the streets, making the totally impossible become the eternally possible. Reality is thermoplastic, not thermosetting, you know. I mean, you can reprogram it much more than people realize. The hex hoax, original sin, logical positivism, those restriction and constriction myths, all that's based on thermosetting reality. Christ, man, there are limits, of course, nobody's nutty enough to deny that, but the limits are nowhere near as rigid as we've been taught to believe. It's much closer to the truth to say that there are no practical limits at all and reality is whatever people decide to make it. But we've been on one restriction kick after another for a couple of thousand years now. The world's longest head trip. And it takes real negative entropy to shake up the foundations. This isn't shit. I got a degree in mathematics, man. I studied engineering myself a long time ago, Joe said. I realize that part of what you say is true. It's all true. The land belongs to the landlords right now because of magic. People worship the deeds in the government offices and they won't dare move onto a square of ground if one of the deeds says somebody else owns it. It's a head trip, a kind of magic, and you need the opposite magic to lift the curse. You need shock elements to break up and disorganize the chains of command in the brain, the mind-forged manacles that Blake wrote about. That's the unpredictable elements, dads, the erratic, the erotic, the eristic. Tim Leary said it. People have to go out of their minds before they can come to their senses. They can't feel and touch and smell the real earth, man, as long as the manacles in the cortex tells them it belongs to somebody else. If you don't want to call it magic, call it counter-conditioning. 
but the principle is the same. Breaking up the trip society laid on us and starting our own trip. Bringing back old realities that are supposed to be dead, creating new realities. Astrology, demons, lifting poetry off of the written page into the acts of your daily life. Surrealism, dig? And Tonin Arto and Andre Breton put it in a nutshell in the first Surrealist Manifesto. Total transformation of mind and all that resembles it. They knew all about the Illuminated Lodge founded in Munich in 1923, that it controlled Wall Street and Hitler and Stalin through witchcraft. We've got to get into witchcraft ourselves to undo the hex they've cast on everybody's mind. All hail Discordia. You read me? When they finally parted and Joe headed back for his hotel, the spell ended. I've been listening to a spaced-out acid head all night, Joe thought, in his cab headed south toward the loop, and almost managing to believe him. If I keep on with this little experiment, I will believe him. And that's how insanity always begins. You find reality unbearable and start manufacturing a fantasy alternative. With an effort of will, he forced himself back into his usual framework. No matter how cruel reality was, Joe Malik would face it and would not follow the yippies and crazies in the joyride to cloud cuckoo land. But when he arrived at his hotel door and noticed for the first time that he had room 23, he had to fight the impulse to call Simon on the phone and tell him about the latest invasion of surrealism into the real world. And he lay awake in his bed for hours, remembering twenty-threes that had occurred in his own life, and wondering about the origin of that mysterious bit of 1929 slang, 23 skidoo. After being lost for an hour in Hitler's old neighbourhood, Clark Kent and his supermen finally found Ludwigstrasse and got out of Munich. About 40 miles and we'll be in Ingolstadt, Kent Mohammed Pearson said. At last, one of the supermen groaned. Just then, a tiny Volkswagen inched past their VW bus, like an infant running ahead of its mother, and Kent looked bemused. Did you check out that cat at the wheel? I saw him once before and never forgot it because he was acting so weird. It was in Mexico City. Funny seeing him again halfway around the world numpteen years later. Go catch him, another superman commented. With the AMA and the trashes and other heavy groups, we're going to get buried alive. Let's make sure that at least he knows we were in Ingolstadt for this gig. Just like a tree that's standing by the water. The morning after the wobbly meeting, Simon telephoned Joe. Listen, he asked. Do you have to fly back to New York today? Can you possibly stay over a night? I got something I'd like you to see. It's time we started reaching people in your generation and really showing you instead of just telling you. Are you game? And Joe Malik, ex-Trotskyist, ex-engineering student, ex-liberal, ex-Catholic, heard himself saying... Yes. And heard a louder voice, unspeaking, uttering a more profound... Yes. Deep inside himself, he was game. For astrology, for I Ching, for LSD, for demons, for whatever Simon had to offer as an alternative to the world of sane and rational men who were sanely and rationally plotting their course toward what could only be the annihilation of the planet. We shall not be moved. God is dead, the priest chanted. God is dead, the congregation repeated in chorus. God is dead. We are all absolutely free, the priest intoned more rhythmically. God is dead, the congregation picked up the almost hypnotic beat. We are all absolutely free. Joe shifted nervously in his chair. The blasphemy was exhilarating, but also strangely disturbing. He wondered how much fear of hell still lingered in the back corridors of his skull, left over from his Catholic boyhood. They were in an elegant apartment high above Lakeshore Drive. 
We always meet here, Simon had explained, because of the acrostic significance of the street name. And the sounds of the automobile traffic far below mingled strangely with the preparations for what Joe already guessed was a black mass. Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law, the priest chanted. Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law, Joe repeated with the rest of the congregation. The priest who was the only one who had not removed his clothes before the beginning of the ceremony, was a slightly red-faced middle-aged man in a Roman collar, and part of Joe's discomfort derived from the fact that he looked so much like every Catholic priest he had known in his childhood. It had not helped matters that he had given his name when Simon introduced Joe to him as Padre Pederastia, which he pronounced with a very campy inflection looking flirtatiously directly in Joe's eyes. The congregation divided, in Joe's mind, into two easily distinguishable groups. Poor full-time hippies from the old town area and rich part-time hippies from Lakeshore Drive itself and no doubt also from the local advertising agencies on Michigan Avenue. There were only 11 of them, however, including Joe and Padre Pederastia made 12... Where was the traditional thirteenth? Prepare the pentad, Padre Pederastia commanded. Simon and a rather good-looking young female, both quite unselfconscious in their nakedness, arose and left the group, walking toward the door which Joe had assumed led to the bedroom area. They stopped to take some chalk from a table on which hashish and sandalwood incense were burning in a goat's head taper then squatted to draw a large pentagon on the blood-red rug. A triangle was then added to each side of the pentagon, forming a star, the special kind of star, Joe knew, which was known as pentagram, symbol of werewolves and also of demons. He found himself remembering the corny old poem from the Lon Chaney Jr. movies, but it suddenly didn't sound like kitsch anymore. Even a man who is pure of heart and says his prayers by night can turn to a wolf when the wolf bane blooms and the autumn moon is bright. I owe, the priest chanted raptly. I owe, the chorus came. I owe, e o, evo e, the chant rose weirdly. I O E O Ever A The rhythmic reply came in cadence. Joe felt a strange, ashy, acrid taste gathering in his mouth, and a coldness creeping into his toes and fingers. The air too seemed suddenly greasy and unpleasantly mucidly moist. I O E O Evo A. He. The priest screamed in fear or in ecstasy. I O E O. Evo A. He. Joe heard himself joining the others. Was it imagination? Or were all their voices subtly changing in a bestial and pongoid fashion? All son of. Va ore sagi, the priest said more softly. All son of va ore si sagi, they chorused. It is accomplished, the priest said. We may pass the guardian. The congregation arose and moved toward the door. Each person, Joe noticed, was careful to step into the pentagram and pause there a moment, gathering strength before actually approaching the door. When it was his turn, he discovered why. The carving on the door, which had seemed merely obscene and ghoulish from across the room, was more disturbing when you were closer to it. It was not easy to convince yourself that those eyes were just a trick of trompe de l'oeil. The mind insisted on feeling that they very definitely looked at you, and not affectionately as you passed. This thing 
was the Guardian, which had to be pacified before they could enter the next room. Joe's fingers and toes were definitely freezing, and auto-suggestion didn't seem a very plausible explanation. He seriously wondered about the possibility of frostbite. But then he stepped into the pentagram, and the cold suddenly decreased. The eyes of the Guardian were less menacing, and a feeling of renewed energy flowed through his body, such as he had experienced in a sensitivity training session after he had been cajoled by the leader into unleashing a great deal of pent-up anxiety and rage by kicking, screaming, weeping and cursing. He passed the Guardian easily and entered the room where the real action would occur. It was as if he had left the 20th century. The furnishings and the very architecture were Hebraic, Arabic and medieval European, all mixed together in a most disorienting way and entirely unrelieved by any trace of the modern or functional. A black draped altar stood in the centre and upon it lay the 13th member of the coven. She was a woman with red hair and green eyes the traits which Satan supposedly relished most in mortal females. There had been a time, Joe remembered, when any woman having those features was automatically suspected of witchcraft. She was, of course, naked, and her body would be the medium through which this strange sacrament would be attempted. What am I doing here? Joe thought frantically. Why don't I leave these lunatics and get back to the world I know? The world where all the horrors are, after all, merely human. But he knew the answer. He could not, literally could not, attempt to pass the Guardian until all those present gave their consent. Padre Pederastia was speaking. This part of the ceremony, he said, camping outrageously, is very distasteful to me, as you all know, if only our father below would allow us to substitute a boy on the altar when I'm officiating. But alas, he is, as we all know, very rigid about such things. As usual, therefore, I will ask the newest member to take my place for this rite. Joe knew from the Malleus Maleficarum and other grimoires what the rite was, and he was both excited and frightened. He approached the altar nervously, noting the others forming a pentagon around the nude woman and himself. She had a lovely body with large breasts and fine nipples, but he was still too nervous to become aroused physically. Padre Pederastia handed him the host. I stole this from the church myself, he whispered. You can be sure it is fully consecrated and completely potent. You know what to do? Joe nodded, unable to meet the priest's lascivious eyes. He took the host and spat upon it quickly. The greasiness and electrically charged quality of the air seemed to increase sharply. The light seemed harsher, like the glint of a sword, just as schizophrenics often describe light as a hostile or destructive force. He stepped forward and placed the host upon the thighs of the Bride of Satan. Immediately she moaned softly, as if the simple touch were more erotic than one momentary contact could possibly be. Her legs spread voluptuously, and the middle of the host crumpled as it sunk slightly into her red pubic hair. The effect was at once powerful, her whole body shuddered, and the host was drawn further into her obviously moist cunt. Using his finger, Joe pushed it the rest of the way in, and she began breathing in a hoarse staccato rhythm. Joe Malik knelt to complete the rite. He felt like a fool and a pervert. He had never performed oral sex or any kind of sex in front of an audience before. He wasn't even turned on erotically. 
He went ahead just to find out if there was any real magic in this revolting lunacy. As soon as his tongue entered her, she began heaving, and he knew her first orgasm would arrive rapidly. His penis finally began swelling. He began licking the host caressingly. Inside his temple, a drum seemed to be beating hollowly. He hardly noticed it when she came. His senses spun and he licked more, aware only that she flowed more heavily and thickly than any woman he had known. He put his thumb in her anus and his middle finger in her vagina, keeping his tongue in the clitoral area, doing it upright. This was the technique occultists call the right of Shiva. Irreverently, he remembered that swingers call it the one-man band. He felt an unusual electrical quality in her pubic hair and was aware of a heaviness and tension in his penis, more powerful than he'd ever known in his life. But all else was drowned out by the drumming in his head and the cunt taste, cunt smell, cunt warmth. She was Ishtar. Aphrodite Venus. The experience was so intense, he began to feel a real religious dimension to it. Hadn't some 19th century anthropologist argued that cunt worship was the earliest religion? He didn't even know this woman, and yet he had an emotion beyond love. True reverence. Trippy, as Simon would say. How many times she came, he never knew. He came himself without once touching his penis when the host was finally dissolved. He staggered back dizzily, and the air now seemed as resistant to motion as brackish water. The priest began chanting. By Ashtoreth, by Pan Pangenitor, by the yellow sign, by the gifts I have made and the powers I have purchased, by he who is not to be named, by Rabban and by Azathoth, by Samael, by Amon and Ra, Vente, Vente, Lucifer, Lux, Fiat. Joe never saw it. He felt it. And it was like chemical mace blinding and numbing him at once. Come not in that form, the priest screamed. By Jesus, Elohim, and the powers that you fear, I command thee, come not in that form, Yodhivahi, come not in that form. One of the women began weeping in fear. Quiet, you fool, Simon shouted at her. Don't give it more power. Your tongue is bound until I release it, the priest said to her but the distraction of his attention had its cost. Joe felt it growing in potency again, and so did the others, judging from their sudden involuntary gasps. Come not in that form, the priest shouted. By the cross of gold and by the rose of ruby, and by Mary's son I command and demand it of thee. Come not in that form, by thy master Kronzon, by Pangenitor and Panfage. Come not in that form. There was a hiss, like air pouring into a vacuum, and the atmosphere began to clear. But it also dropped abruptly in temperature. Master, call no more upon those names. I meant not to harm thee. The voice was the most shocking experience of the night for Joe. It was oily, flattering, obscenely humble, but there was still within it a secret strength that revealed all too well that the priest's power over it, however obtained, was temporary. That both of them knew it, and that the price of that power was something it longed to collect. Come not in that form either, said the priest, more stern and more confident. Ye know full well that such tones and manners are also intended to frighten, and I like not such jokes. 
Come in this form which thou habitually wearest in thy current earthly activities, or I shall banish thee back to that realm of which you like not to imagine. I command. I command. I command. There was nothing campy about the Padre now. It was just a room again. An odd, medieval, mid-eastern room, but just a room. The figure that stood among them could not have looked less like a demon. Okay, it said in a pleasant American voice. We don't have to get touchy and hostile with each other over a little theatrics, do we? Just tell me what sort of business transaction you want and drag me here for, and I'm sure we can work out all the details in a down-home business-like, cards-on-the-table fashion with no hard feelings and mutual satisfaction all around. It looked like Billy Graham. The Kennedys, Martin Luther King. You are fantastically naive still, George. It goes back much, much farther. Hagbard was relaxing with some Alamut black hash after the Battle of Atlantis. Look at the pictures of Woodrow Wilson in his last months. The haggard look, the vague eyes, and, in fact, symptoms of a certain slow-acting and undetectable poison. They slipped it to him at Versailles. Or look into the Lincoln caper. Who opposed the Greenback plan, the closest thing to flax script America ever had? Stanton, the banker. Who ordered all roads out of Washington closed except one? Stanton, the banker. And Booth went straight for that road. Who got a hold of Booth's diary afterward? Stanton, the banker. And turned it over to the archives with 17 pages missing? Stanton, the banker. George, you have so much to learn about real history. The Reverend William Helmer, religious columnist for Confrontation, stared at the telegram... Joe Malik was supposed to be in Chicago covering the SDS convention. What was he doing in Providence, Rhode Island? And what was he involved in that could provoke such an extraordinary communication? Helmer reread the telegram carefully. Drop next month's column. We'll pay large bonus for prompt answers to these questions. First, trace all movements of Reverend Billy Graham during the last week and find out if he could possibly have gotten to Chicago surreptitiously. Second, send me a list of reliable books on Satanism and witchcraft in the modern world. Tell nobody else on the magazine about this. Wire me care of Jerry Mallory, Hotel Benefit, Providence, Rhode Island. P.S. Find out where the John Dillinger Died for You Society has its headquarters. Joe Malik. Those STS kids must have turned him on with acid, Helmer decided. Well, he was still the boss, and he paid nice bonuses when he was pleased. Helmer reached for the phone. Howard the Dolphin was singing a very satirical song about sharks as he swam to meet the Leaf Erickson at Paos. James Walking Bear had no great love for pale faces most of the time, but he had just dropped six peyote buttons before this Professor Mallory arrived and he was feeling benevolent and forgiving. After all, the road chief once said at a very sacred midsummer peyote festival that the line about forgiving those who trespass against us had a special meaning for Indians. Only when we all forgave the whites, he had said, would our hearts be totally pure. And when our hearts were pure, the curse would be lifted. The white men would cease to trespass, Go home to Europe and vex one another instead of persecuting us. James tried to forgive the professor for being white and found, as usual, that peyote made forgiveness easier. Billy Frashard, he said. Well, she died back in 68. I know that, the professor said. What I'm looking for is any photograph she may have left. Sure, James knew what kind of photographs... You mean ones that had Dillinger in them? Yes. She was his mistress, virtually his common-law wife for a long time, and no soap. You're years too late. Reporters bought up everything she had that showed even the back of Dillinger's head. 
Way back, long before she came here to the reservation to die. Well, did you know her? Sure. Jones was careful not to be spiteful, and didn't add, All Menominee Indians know one another in a way you whites can't understand knowing. Did she ever converse about Dillinger? Of course. Old women always talk about their dead men. Always say the same thing, too. Never was another man as good as him, except when they say there never was another man as bad as him. They only say that when they're drunk, though. The pale face kept turning colors, the way people do when you're on peyote. Now he looked almost like an Indian. That made it easier to talk to him. Did she ever say anything about John's attitude towards the Masons? Why shouldn't people turn colors? All the trouble in the world came from the fact that they usually stayed the same color. James nodded profoundly. As usual, Peyote had brought him a big truth. If whites and blacks and Indians were turning colors all the time, there wouldn't be any hate in the world, because nobody would know which people to hate. I said, did she ever mention John's attitude to the Masons? Oh. Oh, yes. Funny you should ask that. The man had a halo round his head now, and James wondered what that meant. Every time he took peyote alone, things like that would happen, and he'd end up wishing there were a road chief or some other priest around to explain these signs properly. But what about the Masons? Oh, yes. Billy said the Masons were the only people John Dillinger really hated. He said they railroaded him to prison the first time, and they owned all the banks, so he was getting even by robbing them. The professor's mouth dropped open in surprise and delight, and James thought it was kind of funny to see that, especially with the halo turning from pink to blue to pink to blue to pink again at the same time. A big mouth, a tiny brain, he only thinks of blood and pain. Howard sang... Notes found by a TWA stewardess in a seat vacated by a Mr. John Mason after a Madison, Wisconsin to Mexico City flight, June the 29th, 1969, one week after the last SDS convention of all time. We only robbed from the banks what the banks robbed from the people. Dillinger, Crown Point Jail, 1934, could have come from any anarchist text. Lucifer, bringer of light. Weishaupt's illumination and Voltaire's enlightenment, from the Latin lux, meaning light. Christianity, all in threes, trinity, etc. Buddhism in fours. Illuminism in fives. A progression? Hopi teaching. All men have four souls now, but in future we'll have five souls. Find an anthropologist for more data on this. Who decided the Pentagon building should have that particular shape? Kick out the jams. Cross-check. Adam, the first man... Vice, to know, helped chief or leader. The first man to be a leader of those who know. Assume name from the beginning. Yok Sotot, in Pnactotic manuscripts, could be Yog Sothoth. D-E-A-T-H. Don't ever antagonise the horn. Does Pinchon know? Must get Simon to explain the yellow sign and the Aklo chants. Might need protection. C says the H neophobe type outnumbers us 1,000 to 1. If so, all this is hopeless. What gets me is how much has been out in the open for so long. Not just in Lovecraft, Joyce, Melville, etc., or in the Bugs Bunny cartoons, but in scholarly works that pretend to explain. 
Anybody who wants to go to the trouble can find out, for instance, that the secret of the Eleusinian mysteries was the words whispered to the novice after he got the magic mushroom. Osiris is a black god. Five words, of course. But no historian, archaeologist, anthropologist, folklorist, etc. has understood. Or those who did understand didn't care to admit it. Can I trust C? For that matter, can I trust Simon? This matter of Tlarlock should convince me one way or the other. He only thinks of blood and slaughter. The shark should live on land, not water. To hell with the shark and all his kin, and fight like hell when you see his fin. When Joe Malik got off the plane at Los Angeles International Airport, Simon was waiting for him. We'll talk in your car, Joe said briefly. The car being Simon's was naturally a psychedelic Volkswagen. Well? He asked as they drove out of the airport onto Central Avenue. It all checks out, Joe said with an odd calm. It did rain blue cats when they dug up Tlaloc. Mexico City had unusual and unseasonable rains ever since. The missing tooth was on the right, and the corpse at the Biograph Theater had a missing tooth on the left. Billy Graham couldn't have gotten to Chicago by any normal means, so that was either the best damn makeup job in the history of show business and plastic surgery, or I witnessed a genuine miracle. And all the rest of it, the law of fives and all. I'm sold. I no longer claim membership in the Liberal Intellectual Guild. You behold in me a horrible example of creeping mysticism. Ready to try acid? Yes. Joe said. I'm ready to try acid. I only regret that I have but one mind to lose for my Shiva Dashana. Right on. First, though, you'll meet him. I'll drive right to his bungalow. It's not far from here. Simon began humming as he drove. Joe recognized the tune as the fugs. Ramesses too is dead, my love. They drove for a while in silence, and Joe finally asked, How old is our little group exactly? Since 1888, Simon said. That's when Rhodes horned in and they kicked out the jams. Like I told you in Chicago after the Sabbath. And Karl Marx, a schmuck, a dupe. A nebish from the word go. Simon made an abrupt turn. Here we are at his house. The greatest headache they had since Harry Houdini knocked out their spiritualist fronts. He grinned. How do you think you'll feel talking to a dead man? Weird, Joe said. But I felt weird for the last week and a half. Simon parked the car and held the door open. Just think, he said. Hoover's sitting there every day with the desk mask on his desk and half-suspecting, deep down in his bones, how we suck at him. They crossed the yard of the small, modest bungalow. What a front, huh? Simon chuckled. He knocked. A little old man, he was five foot seven exactly, Joe remembered from the FBI files, opened the door. Here's our new recruit, Simon said simply. Come in, John Dillinger just said. And tell me how an asshole egghead like you can help us beat the shit out of those motherfucking Illuminati cocksuckers. They fill their books with obscene words claiming that this is realism. Smiling Jim shouted to the KCUF assembly. It's not my idea of realism. I don't know anybody who talks in that gutter language they call realism. And they describe every possible perversion, acts against nature that are so outrageous I wouldn't sully this audience's ears by even mentioning their medical names. Some of them even glorify the criminal and the anarchist. I'd like to see one of these hacks come up to me and look me in the eye and say, I didn't do it for money. I was honestly trying to tell a good, honest story that would teach people something of value. They couldn't say that. The lie would stick in their throats. Who can doubt where they get their orders from? What person in this audience needs to be told what group is behind this overflowing sewer of smut and filth? May storms and rains and typhoons beat them. Howard sang on. May great Cthulhu rise and eat them. 
I got into the jams in Michigan City Prison. Didn't you? Much relaxed and less arrogant, was saying as he, Simon and Joe, sat in his living room, drinking black Russians. And Hoover knew from the beginning, Joe asked. Of course. I wanted the bastard to know. Him and every other high-ranking Mason and Rosicrucian and Illuminati front man in the country. The old man laughed harshly. Except for his unmistakable eyes, which still held the strange blend of irony and intensity that Joe had noted in the 1930s photos, he was indistinguishable from any other elderly fellow who had come to California to enjoy his last years in the sun. First bank job I pulled off in Daleville, Indiana. I used the line that I always repeated, lie down on the floor and keep calm. Hoover couldn't miss it. That's been the motto of the jams ever since Diogenes the Cynic. He knew no ordinary bank robber would be quoting an obscure Greek philosopher. The reason I repeated it on every heist was just to rub it in and let him know I was taunting him. But going back to Michigan City Prison, Jab prompted, sipping his drink, Pierpoint was the one who initiated me. He'd been with the jams for years by then. I was just a kid, you know, in my early twenties. And I had only pulled one job, a real botch. I couldn't understand why I got such a stiff sentence. After the D.A. promised me clemency if I'd pled guilty, and I was kind of bitter. But old Harry Pierpoint saw my potential. At first I thought he was just another big house faggot when he started tracking me around and asking me all sorts of personal questions. But he was what I wanted to become, a successful bank robber, so I played along. To tell you the truth, I was so horny it wouldn't have mattered if he was a faggot. You've no idea how horny a man gets in prison. That's why Babyface Nelson and a lot of other guys preferred to die rather than go back to the big house again. Hell, if you haven't been there, you can't understand. You just don't know what being horny is. Well, anyway, after a lot of bull about Jesus and Jehovah and the Bible and all that, Harry just asked me point blank one day in the prison yard... You think it's possible there might be a true religion? I was about to say bullshit. Like, there might be an honest cop, but something stopped me. I realized he was dead serious and a lot might depend on my answer. So I was cautious. I said, uh, if there is, I haven't heard about it. And he just came back real quiet. Most people haven't. It was a couple of days afterward that he brought the subject up again. Then he went right on with it, showed me the sacred cow and everything. Took my breath away. The old man's voice trailed off as he sank into silent memories. And it really does go back to Babylon. Joe prompted. I'm not much of an intellectual. Didn't you reply? Action is my arena. Let Simon tell you that part. Simon was eager to leap into the breach. The basic book to confirm our tradition, he said, is the Seven Tablets of Creation, which is dated at about 2500 B.C., the time of Sargon. It describes how Tiamat and Aspu, the first gods, were coexisting in Mumu, the primordial chaos. Von Junst, in his Onuksprelichen Kulten, tells how the justified ancients of Mumu originated, just about the time the Seven Tablets were inscribed. You see, under Sargon... The chief deity was Marduk. I mean, that was what the high priest gave out to the public. In private, of course, they worshipped Loxotot, who became the Yog sothoth of the Necronomicon. But maybe I'm going too fast. Getting back to the official religion of Marduk, it was based on usury. The priests monopolized the medium of exchange and were able to extract interest for lending it. They also monopolized the land and extracted tribute for renting it. It was the beginning of what we laughingly call civilization, which has always rested on rent and interest. The old Babylonian con. The official story was that Mamu was dead, killed in the war between the gods. When the first anarchist group arose, they called themselves Justified Ancients of Mamu, like Lao Tse and the Taoists in China. They wanted to get rid of usury and monopoly and all the other pig shit of civilization and go back to a natural way of life. So, Grok, they took the supposedly dead god Mamu and claimed he was still alive. 
and was actually stronger than all the other gods. They had a good argument. Look around, they say. What do you see most of? Chaos, right? Therefore, the god of chaos is the strongest god and is still alive. Of course, we got our ass whipped good. We were just no match for the Illuminati in those days. Didn't have a clue about how they performed their miracles, for instance. So we got our asses whipped again in Greece when the jams got started again as part of the cynic movement. By the time the whole thing was happening again in Rome, usury and monopoly and the whole bag of tricks, the truce took place. The justified ancients became part of the Illuminati, a special group still keeping our own name but taking orders from the five. We thought we'd humanize them, like the anarchists who stayed in SDS after last year. And so it went until 1888, when Cecil Rhodes started the Circle of Initiates and the big schism occurred. Every meeting would have a faction of Rhodes boys carrying signs that said, Kick out the jams. It was the parting of the ways. They just didn't trust us, or maybe they were afraid of being humanized. But we had learned a lot by our long participation in the Illuminati conspiracy, and now we know how to fight them with their own weapons. Fuck their weapons. Dillinger interrupted. I like to fight them with my weapons. You are behind the big unsolved bank robberies of the last few years. Sure, just in the planning, though, I'm too old to vault over Teller's cages and carry on like I did back in the 30s. John is also fighting on another front. Simon interjected. Didn't you laugh? Yeah, he said. I'm the president of Laughing Buddha Jesus Phallus Inc. You've seen him. If it's not an LBJP, it's not an LP. Laughing Buddha Jesus Phallus? Joe exclaimed. My God, you put out the best rock in the country, the only rock a man my age can listen to without wincing. Thanks, Tillinger said modestly. Actually, the Illuminati owned the companies that put out most of the rock. We started Laughing Buddha Jesus Phallus to counterattack. We were ignoring that front until they got the MC5 to cut a disc called Kick Out the Jams, just to taunt us with old, bitter memories. So we came back with our own releases, and the next thing I know, well, I was making bales of money from it. We've also fed information through third parties to Christian Crusade in Tulsa, Oklahoma, so they could expose some of what the Illuminati are doing in the rock field. You've seen the Christian Crusade publications, Rhythm, Riots, and Revolution, and Communism, Hypnotism, and the Beatles, and so forth? Yeah, Jai said absently. I thought it was not literature. It's so hard, he added, to grasp the whole picture. You'll get used to it, Simon smiled. It just takes a while to sink in. Who really did shoot John Kennedy? Joe asked. I'm sorry, Dylan just said. You're only a private in our army right now. Not cleared for that kind of information yet. I'll just tell you this much. His initials are H.C. So don't trust anybody with those initials, no matter where or how you meet them. He's being fair, Simon told Joe. You'll appreciate it later. An advancement is rapid, Dillinger added. And the rewards are beyond your present understanding. Give him a hint, John, Simon suggested with an anticipatory grin. Tell him how you got out of Crown Point Jail. I've read two versions of that, Joe said. Most of the sources claim you carved a fake gun out of balsa wood and dyed it black with your shoe polish. Tolan's book says that you made that story up and leaked it out to protect the man who really managed the break for you, a federal judge that you bribed to smuggle in a real gun. Which was it? Neither, Dylan just said. Crown Point was known as the escape-proof jail before I crashed out of it, and believe me, it deserved the name. You want to know how I did it? I walked through walls. Listen. Hare Krishna. Hare Hare. The sun beat down on the town of Daleville on July the 17th, 1933, like a rain of fire. Motoring down the main street, John Dillinger felt the perspiration on his neck. Although he had been paroled three weeks earlier, he was still pale from his nine years in prison, and the sunlight was cruel on his almost albino-tinted skin. 
I'm going to have to walk through that door all by myself, he thought, all alone, and fighting every kind of fear and guilt that has been beaten into me from childhood on. The spirit of Mamu is stronger than the Illuminati's technology, Pitpoint had said. Remember that. We've got the second law of thermodynamics on our side. Chaos steadily increases all over the universe. All law and order is a kind of temporary accident. But I've got to walk through that door all alone. The secret of the five depends on it. This time it's my turn to be the goat. Pierpont and Van Meter and the others were still back in Michigan City Prison. It was all in his hands. Being the first one paroled, he had to raise the money to finance the jailbreak that would get the others out. Then, having proved himself, he would be taught the jam miracles. The bank suddenly loomed before him. Too suddenly. His heart skipped a beat. Then calmly he drove his Chevrolet coupe over to the curb and parked. I should have prepared better. This car should be souped up like the ones Clyde Barrow uses. Well, I'll know that the next time. He left his hands on the steering wheel and squeezed hard. He took a deep breath and repeated the formula. Twenty-three skidoo. It helped a little, but he still wanted to get the hell out of there. He wanted to drive straight back to his father's farm in Mooresville and find a job and learn all the straight things again, how to kiss a boss's ass and how to look the parole officer straight in the eye and be like everybody else. But everybody else was an Illuminati puppet and didn't know it. He did know it and was going to liberate himself. Hell, that's what a younger John Dillinger thought back in 1924, except that he hadn't known about the Illuminati or the jams then. But he was trying to liberate himself in his own way when he held up that grocer. And what did it lead to? Nine years of misery and monotony and almost going mad with horniness in a stinking cell. And it'll be nine years more if I fuck up today. The spirit of Mamu is stronger than the Illuminati's technology. He got out of the car and forced his feet and legs to move and he walked straight for the bank door. Fuck it, he said. Twenty-three skidoo. He walked through the door, and then he did the thing the bank tellers remembered after and told the police. He reached up and adjusted his straw hat to the most dapper and debonair angle, and he grinned. All right, this is a stick-up. He said, clearly, taking out his pistol. Everybody lie down on the floor and keep calm. None of you will get hurt. Oh, God. A female teller gasped. Don't shoot, please. Don't shoot. Don't worry, honey. John did as I said easily. I don't want to hurt anybody. Just open the vault. Like a tree that's planted by the water? That afternoon, the old man said, I met Calvin Coolidge in the woods near my father's farm at Mooresville. I gave him the haul, $20,000, and it went into the jam treasury. He gave me 20 tons of ham script. Calvin Coolidge? Joe Malik exclaimed. Well, of course, I knew it wasn't really Calvin Coolidge, but that was the form he chose to appear in. Who or what he really is, I haven't learned yet. You met him in Chicago, Simon added gleefully. He appeared as Billy Graham that time. You mean the de- Satan, Simon said simply, is just another of the innumerable masks he wears. Behind the mask is a man, and behind the man is another mask. It's all a matter of merging multiverses, remember? Don't look for an ultimate reality. There isn't any. Then this person, this being... Joe protested. Really is supernatural. Supernatural schmoopernatural. Simon grimaced. You're still like the people in that mathematical parable about flatland. You can only think in categories of right and left, and I'm talking about up and down. So you say supernatural. There is no supernatural. There are just more dimensions than you're accustomed to, that's all. If you were living in Flatland and I stepped out of your plane into a plane at a different angle, it would look to you as if I'd vanished into thin air. Somebody looking down from our three-dimensional viewpoint would see me going off at a tangent from you and wonder why you were acting so distressed and surprised about it. 
but the flash of light. It's energy transformation. Simon explained patiently. Look, the reason you can only think three-dimensionally is because there are only three directions in cubicle space. That's why the Illuminati and some of the kids they've allowed to become partially Illuminized lately refer to ordinary science as square. The basic energy vector coordinates of universe are five-dimensional, of course, and can best be visualized in terms of the five sides of the Illuminati Pyramid of Egypt. Five sides? Joe objected. It only has four. You're ignoring the bottom. Oh, go on. Energy is always triangular, not cubical. Bucky Fuller has a line on this, by the way. He's the first one outside the Illuminati to discover it independently. The basic energy transformation we're concerned with is the one Fuller hadn't discovered yet, although he said he's looking for it. The one that ties mind into the matter-energy continuum. The pyramid is the key. You take a man in the lotus position and draw lines from his pineal gland, the third eye, as the Buddhists call it, to his two knees, and from each knee to the other. And this is what you get. Simon sketched rapidly in his notepad and passed it over to Joe. When the pineal eye opens, after fear is conquered, after your first bad trip, you can control the energy field entirely, Simon went on. An Irish Illuminatus of the ninth century, Scotus Ergina, put it very simply, in five words, of course, when he said, Omnia quia sunt, lumina sunt. All things that are, are lights. Einstein also put it into five symbols when he wrote E equals MC squared. The actual transformation doesn't require atomic reactors and all that jazz once you learn how to control the mind vectors, but it always lets off one hell of a flash, as John can tell you. Damn near blinded me and knocked me on my ass that first time in the woods. Dillinger agreed. But I was sure glad to know the trick. I was never afraid of being arrested after that, because I could always walk out of any jail they put me in. That's why the feds decided to kill me, you know. It was embarrassing to always find me wandering around loose again after a few days after they locked me up. You know, the background to the Biograph Theater scam. They killed three guys in Chicago without giving them a chance to surrender because they thought I was one of them. Well, those three were all wanted in New York for armed robbery, so nobody criticized the cops much for that caper. But then up in Lake Geneva, Wisconsin, they shot three very respectable businessmen. And one of them went and died. And Hoover's heroes caught all sorts of crap from the newspapers. So I knew where it was at. I could never again surrender and walk away a few days later. We had to produce a body for them. The old man looked suddenly sad. There was one possibility that we hated to think about. But luckily, it didn't come to that. The gimmick we finally worked out was perfect. And everything... Really follows the Fives Law? Joe asked. More than you can guess. Dillinger remarked blandly. Even when you're dealing with social fields, Simon added. We've run studies of cultures where the Illuminati were not in control, and they still follow Weishaupt's five-stage pattern. Verwirrung, Zweitracht, Unordnung, Beamten Herrschaft, and Grummet. That is, chaos, discord, confusion bureaucracy, and aftermath. America right now is between the fourth and fifth stages, or you might say that the older generation is mostly in the Beamton hair shaft, and the younger generation is moving into Grummet rapidly. Joe took another stiff drink and shook his head. But why do they leave so much of it out in the open? I mean, not merely the really shocking things you told me about the Bugs Bunny cartoons, but putting the pyramid on the dollar bill where everybody sees it almost every day. Hell, Simon said, look what Beethoven did when Vice helped illuminated him. Went right home and wrote the Fifth Symphony. You know how it begins. Da-da-da-dum. Morse code for five. The Roman numeral for five. Right out in the open, as you say. 
It amuses the devil out of them to confirm their low opinion of the rest of humanity by putting things up front like that and watching how almost everybody misses it. Of course, if somebody doesn't miss something, they recruit him right away. Look at Genesis. Looks fit. Right on the first page. They do it all the time. The Pentagon Building, 23 Skidoo, the lyrics of rock songs like Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. How obvious can you get? Melville was one of the most outrageous of the bunch. The very first sentence of Moby Dick tells you he's a disciple of Hassan Hisabar. But you can't find a single Melville scholar who's followed up that lead in spite of Ahab being a truncated anagram of Sabah. He even tells you again and again, directly and indirectly, that Moby Dick and Leviathan are the same creature, and that Moby Dick is often seen at the same time in two different parts of the world. But not one reader in a million grocks. What he's hinting at, there's a whole chapter on whiteness and why white is really more terrifying than black. All the critics miss the point. Osiris is a black god. Joe quoted. Right on! You're going to advance fast, Simon said enthusiastically. In fact, I think it's time for you to get off the verbal level and really confront your own Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. Your own Lady Isis. Yeah, Dylan just said. The Leif Erickson is laying off sure near California right now. Hagbard's running some hashish to the students at Berkeley. He's got a new black chick in his crew who plays the Lucy role extremely well. We'll have him send her ashore for the right. I suggest that you two drive up to the Norton Lodge in Frisco, and I'll arrange for her to meet you there. I don't like dealing with Hagboy, Simon said. He's a right-wing nut, and so is his whole gang. He's one of the best allies we have against the Illuminati. Didn't just said. Besides... I want to exchange some hemp script for some of his flax script. Right now, the Mad Dog Bunch won't accept anything but flax script. They think Nixon is really going to knock the bottom out of the hemp market. And you know what they do with Federal Reserve notes. Every time they get one, they burn it. Instant demorage, they call it. Pure aisle, Simon pronounced. It'll take decades to undermine the Fed that way. Well, Dillon just said, those are the kinds of people we have to deal with. The jams can't do it all alone, you know. Sure, Simon shrugged. But it bugs me. He stood up and put his drink on the table. Let's go, he said to Joe. You're going to be illuminized. Dillinger accompanied them to the door and leaned close to Joe and said, A word of advice about the right. Yes? Dillinger lowered his voice. Lie down on the floor and keep calm, he said. And his old impudent grin flashed wickedly. Joe stood there, looking at the mocking bandit, and it seemed to him a, a freeze, and a freeze in time. A moment that would linger as another stage of illumination forever in his mind. Sister Cecilia, back in Resurrection School, spoke out of the abyss of memory. Stand in the corner, Joseph Malik. And he remembered, too, the chalk that he crumbled slowly between his fingers. The feeling of needing to urinate, the long wait, and then Father Volpe entering the classroom, his voice like thunder. Where is he? Where is the boy who dared to disagree with the good sister that God sent to instruct him? And the other children led out of the classroom and across the street to the church to pray for his soul while the priest harangued him. Do you know how hot hell is? Do you know how hot the worst part of hell is? That's where they send people who have the good fortune to be born into the church and then rebel against it, misled by pride of intellect. And five years later, those two faces came back. The priest, angry and dogmatic, demanding obedience, and the bandit, sardonic, encouraging cynicism. And Joe understood that he might someday... Have to kill Hagbard Chalene. But more years had to pass, and the Fernando Poo incident had to pass, and Joe had to plan the bombing of his own magazine with Tobias Knight before he knew that he would, in fact, kill Chalene without compunction if it were necessary. But on March the 31st, in that year of fruition for all the Illuminati's plans, while the President of the United States went on the air to threaten all-out thermonuclear heck. A young lady named Concepcion Galore 
lay nude on a bed in the Hotel de Rutti in Santa Isabel and said, Isha Loigor. What's a Loigor? asked her companion, an Englishman named Fission Chips, who had been born on Hiroshima Day and named by a father who cared more for physics than for the humanities. The room was in the luxury suite of the Hotel de Rutti, which meant that it was decorated in abominable Spanish Moorish decor. The sheets were changed daily to a less luxurious suite. The cockroaches were minimal, and the plumbing sometimes worked. Conception contemplated the bullfight mural on the opposite wall, Manoletti turning an elegant Ferenica on an unconvincingly drawn bull, and said thoughtfully, Ah, oh, Eloigor is a god of the black people, the natives. A very bad god. Chips glanced at the statue again and said, more to himself than to the peasant girl, Looks vaguely like Tlaloc in Mexico City, crossed with one of those Polynesian Fafulu tikis. The starry wisdom people are very interested in these statues, Concepcion said, just to be making conversation, since it was obvious that Chips wasn't going to be ready to prong her again for at least another half hour. Indeed, Chips said, equally bored. Who are the starry wisdom people? A church down on Tequila Remoto Street, what used to be La Mombo Street, and was Franco Street when I was a girl. Funny church. The girl frowned, thinking about them. When I worked in the telegraph office, I was always seeing the telegrams, all in cold, and never to another church, always to banks, all over Europe and North and South America. You don't say. Drawled Chips, no longer bored, but trying to sound casual. His code number in British intelligence was, of course, quadruple O five. Why are they interested in these statues? He was thinking that statues, properly hollowed out, could transport heroin. He was already sure that starry wisdom was a front for bugger. In 1933, at Harvard, Professor Tokus told his Psychology 101 class... Now, the child feels frightened and inferior, according to Adler, because he is, in fact, physically smaller and weaker than the adult. Thus, he knows he has no chance of successful rebellion, but nevertheless, he dreams about it. This is the origin of the Oedipus complex in Adler's system. Not sex, but the will to power itself. The class will readily see the influence of Nietzsche. Robert Putney Drake, glancing around the room, was quite sure that most of the students would not readily see anything. And Tokus himself didn't really see either. The child, Drake had decided, it was the cornerstone of his own system of psychology, was not brainwashed by sentimentality, religion, ethics and other bullshit. The child saw clearly that in every relationship there is a dominant party and a submissive party. And the child, in its quite correct egotism, determined to become the dominant party. It was that simple, except, of course, that the brainwashing takes effect eventually in most cases. And by about this time, the college years, most of them were ready to become robots and accept the submissive role. Professor Tokus droned on, and Drake... Serene, in his lack of superego, continued to dream of how he would seize the dominant role. In New York, Arthur Flagenheimer, Drake's psychic twin, stood before seventeen robed figures, one wearing a goat's head mask, and repeated, I will forever heal, always conceal, never reveal any art or arts, part or parts. You look like a robot. Jay Malik says in a warped room in a skewered time in San Francisco. I mean, you move and walk like a robot. Hold on to that, Mr. Wabbit, says a bearded young man with a saturnine smile. Some trippers see themselves as robots. Others see the guide as a robot. Hold that perspective. Is it a hallucination or is it a recognition of something we usually black out? Wait, Joe says. Part of you is like a robot, but part of you is alive, like a growing thing, a tree or a plant. The young man continues to smile, his face drifting above his body toward the mandala painted on the ceiling. 
Well, he asks, do you think that might be a good poetic shorthand? That part of me is mechanical, like a robot, and part of me is organic, like a rose bush? And what's the difference between the mechanical and the organic? Isn't a rose bush a kind of machine used by the DNA code to produce more rose bushes? No. Joe says. Everything is mechanical, but people are different. A cat has a grace that we've lost, or partly lost. How do you think we've lost it? And Joe sees the face of Father Volpe, and hears the voice screaming about submission. The SAC bases await the presidential order to take off for Fernando Poo. Atlanta Hope addresses a rally in Atlanta, Georgia, protesting the gutless appeasement of the ComSimp administration in not threatening to bomb Moscow and Peking the same time as Santa Isabel. The Premier of Russia rereads his speech nervously as the TV cameras are set up in his office. And in socialist solidarity with the freedom-loving people of Fernando Pu. The chairman of the Chinese Communist Party, having found the thought of Chairman Mao of little avail, throws the I Ching sticks and looks dismally at hexagram 23. And 99% of the peoples of the world wait for their leaders to tell them what to do. But in Santa Isabel itself, three locked doors across the suite from the now sleeping Concepcion, Fission chips, says angrily into his short wave, Repeat none. Not one Russian or Chinese anywhere on the bloody island. I don't care what Washington says. I'm telling you what I have seen. Now, about the bugger heroin ring here. Sign off. The submarine tells him, HQ is not interested in bugger or heroin right now. Damn and blast. Chip stares at the shortwave set. That bloody well tore it. He would just have to proceed on his own and show those armchair agents back in London, especially that smug W, how little they actually knew about the real problem in Fernando Poo and the world. Storming, he charged back to the bedroom. I'll just get dressed, he thought furiously, including my smoke bombs and luger and laser ray and I'll toddle over to this starry wisdom church and see what I can nose out but when he tore open the bedroom door he stopped momentarily stunned Concepcion still lay in the bed but she was no longer sleeping her throat was neatly cut and a curious dagger with a flame design on it stuck into the pillow beside her Damn blast and thunder, cried oh, 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 5 Now that absolutely does tear it. Every time I find a good piece of ash, those fuckers from Bugger come along and shaft her. Ten minutes later, the go signal came from the White House. A fleet of SAC bombers headed for Santa Isabel with hydrogen bombs. And Fission chips, fully dressed toddled over to the Starry Wisdom Church, where he encountered not bugger, but something on an entirely different plane. <laughs>